There we go. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, for the April session here. Uh, let me get the slides going here. <laughs> I'm Paul Baylog. I'll be your host tonight uh, as normal, I guess. Uh, get uh, Brandon Hunter, Siju John, and uh, Michael Madden, our other steering committee members, and Sabri uh, is our uh, emeritus, and none of which have shown up. Ah, they're slackers, slackers, each and every one of them. But uh, so first off, I just want to thank our sponsors, GoBridge, for the use of the Zoom account, as well as uh, covering the meetup fees. Um, CNCF has been uh, covering some of the hosting fees in the past, and that was when uh, we were doing the uh, Crowdcast, and I keep forgetting to update this slide. So anyway, but, uh, <laughs> you know, being that uh, both of these groups do have their uh, code of conduct, we try to adhere to those and just, you know, make sure everybody's decent to one another. As Bill and Ted say, be excellent to each other. Um, Anyway, uh, it's been a quiet month, at least for me. I don't know if anybody has anything that, uh, any uh, questions or things from, uh, I guess, old business from uh, the last sessions. And let's see. And also too, I'm gonna try to keep uh, monitoring the uh, chat. Let me get that open while I'm thinking about it here. So yeah, if anybody has questions, not during the presentations, I will try to keep that in mind. So anyway, which leads us to our main presenter. I'd like to welcome John Bodner. He's a, uh, I, you know what, actually, I don't even have your official title, but uh, <laughs> I know you're with uh, Capital One and yeah. an author of the O'Reilly book that uh, we will be uh fortunate to give away yeah um well thank you welcome uh, let me uh, get my slides going oh, and while um, you're doing that oh. i gotta give my uh today's beer of the day is from uh chandelure island brewing and i know i said that wrong but it's a surfside pineapple wheat it's uh actually pretty good so <laughs> if you're in gulfport mississippi you can get some of these all right. And then, John, you should be able to just grab. Uh... Oh, got to wait until you release the share. Ah, OK. Uh, let's see. Oops. All right. Definitely don't want to stop recording. Don't want to stop meeting. Um, let's see. Can pause share. That might be it. There we go. See, so you able to grab that? No, so you cannot start screen sharing while other participant is sharing. All right. Huh. So then I will do the stop share and let's hope this doesn't kill everything. All right. There we go. Let's see. Oh, oh come on, Zoom. One second. <laughs> Computer is uh, telling me about. There we go. All right, I have to drop and come back. I'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> uh, in the meantime, Paul. Just have to tell you, your mustache is looking on point. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, it's. I'll, I'll uh, give all the credit to the new mustache wax that I'm using. <laughs> you gonna share the brand? Oh uh, yeah, sure. It's. Uh, I think it was a boss man or something like that. Uh, but uh, it's called Mud Stash. So. Yeah, it seems to have that uh, the grip that I needed. <laughs> All right. Thanks for that. Uh, let's see. All right, everyone can see that. Yep. 
Excellent. Like we're going. Well-oiled machine. Here we go. We are now cooking with gas. That's right. All right. So, um, hi, my name is John Bodner. I'm a software engineer working at Capital One right now as a distinguished engineer, which is sort of the staff engineer position at many other companies. I've been speaking and writing about Go for several years now. Uh, some of you may have seen my talks or read one of my blog posts. Um, so last month, O'Reilly released my new book, Learning Go. As the subtitle says, it's meant to be an idiomatic approach to Go, which means the book tries to encourage you to write Go code that takes advantage of Go's features as the community has figured them out over the past decade or so. Uh, as it explains features, uh, Learning Go tries to teach you how you should best use the feature. Uh, covered up to about Go 116, although the couple of the changes in 116 came out a bit too late to make it into the book. First part of the book covers the basics of the language, but there are chapters on more involved topics. There's one on the context, another on reflection unsafe in Go, one on packages and modules, one on how pointers work and how to best use them, another one on testing. I was even able to include a chapter that covers the upcoming generic support that's coming in 118. Uh, dozens of code samples, most of which are available either on the Go Playground or on GitHub. The digital edition and the print edition are available now. At the end of the talk, I'll put up a link. They'll give you access for 30 days to the book on O'Reilly Learning. Also, everyone attending, please make sure Paul has your name and email because we'll be giving away copies of Learning Go to some lucky attendees. Uh, before you ask, the animal on the cover is a pocket gopher. I, I know it looks a bit like a mole, but they're very different animals. Pocket gophers are herbivores and moles only code in JavaScript. So today we're gonna to talk about concurrency in Go. A concurrency is the computer science term for breaking up a single process into independent components and specifying how those components safely share data. Most languages provide concurrency via a library that uses operating system level threads that share data by attempting to acquire locks. And other languages use functions that are declared to always run asynchronously. But Go is different. Its main concurrency model, which is arguably Go's most famous feature, is based on CSP or communicating sequential processes. And this is a technique that was first described in 1978 by Tony Hoare, who's also the man who invented quicksort. So during this talk, we'll cover how to use concurrency and some patterns that you can use to take advantage of it. But before we do that, we're going to talk about why you want, should use concurrency. And because concurrency is one of Go's signature features, lots of developers who are learning Go, they follow the same five-step process. You know, first they look at a demo or tutorial and say, this is amazing. I'm going to put everything into Go routines. And then they get to step two and say, my program isn't any faster. I'm going to add buffers to my channels. And then we reach the third stage. My channels are all blocking. My programs are deadlocking. I'm going to use really big buffered channels. And then we get to step four. The developer says, channels are still all blocking. I'm just going to use mutexes. And then finally, you get to step five, where developers say, forget it. I'm just going to give up on concurrency. And so let's start with a word of caution. Be sure your program actually benefits from concurrency. You know, people are attracted to it because they believe concurrent programs run faster, but unfortunately, that's not always the case. More concurrency doesn't automatically make things faster and it can make your code a lot harder to understand. The key is understanding that concurrency is not parallelism. Concurrency is just a tool to better structure the problem that you're trying to solve. Parallelism is actually running the code at the same time. And whether or not concurrent code runs in parallel depends on the hardware and on if the algorithm actually supports it. So whether or not you should use concurrency in your program depends on how data flows through the steps in your program. There are times when two steps can be concurrent because the data from one is not required for the other to proceed. And there are other times when two steps must happen in series because one depends on the other's output. So use concurrency when you want to combine data from multiple operations that can operate independently. In 1967, Gene Omdahl, one of the pioneers of computer science, he derived Omdahl's law. And it's a formula for figuring out how much parallel processing can improve performance given how much of the work must be performed sequentially. And this on screen is the formula. And since it's been 25 years since I've taken a computer science class, I am not going to go through and derive it. So for our purposes, all you need to understand is that the more concurrency does not always mean more speed. Another important thing to note is that concurrency isn't worth using if the process that's running concurrently doesn't take a lot of time. Concurrency isn't free. Many common in-memory algorithms are so fast that the overhead of passing values via concurrency just overwhelms any potential time savings you'd gain by running concurrent code in parallel. And this is why concurrent operations are usually used for IO. Reading or writing to disk or a network, it's thousands of times slower than all but the most complicated in-memory processes. If you're not sure if concurrency will help, write your code serially, and then write a benchmark to compare performance with a concurrent implementation. So let's consider an example. Say you're writing a web service that calls three other web services. We're gonna send data to two of those services, 
and then take the results of those two calls and send them to a third service and then return back that result. And this entire process must take less than 50 milliseconds or an error should be returned. Now, this is a good use of concurrency because there are parts of the code that perform IO that can run without interacting with each other. There's a part where we combine the results and there's a limit on how long our code needs to run. And at the end of the talk, we'll see how to implement this code. So let's quickly go over the building blocks for concurrency in Go. Uh, we'll start with the Go routine, which is the core concept in Go's concurrency model. And to understand Go routines, let's just define a couple of terms. Uh, the first is process. A process is an instance of a program that's being run by a computer's operating system. And the operating system associates some resources, such as memory, with the process and makes sure that other processes can't access those resources. A process is composed of one or more threads, and a thread is just a unit of execution that's given some time to run by the operating system. Threads within a process can share access to the resources, and a CPU can execute instructions from one or more threads at the same time, depending on the number of cores. And one of the jobs of an operating system is to schedule threads on the CPU to make sure that every process and every thread within a process gets a chance to run. So Go routines are a lightweight process managed by the Go runtime. And when a Go program starts, the Go runtime creates a number of threads and launches a single Go routine to run your program. And all of the other Go routines created by your program, including the initial ones, are assigned to these threads automatically by the Go runtime scheduler, just as the operating system schedules threads on CPU cores. And this might seem like extra work since the underlying operating system already has a scheduler that manages threads and processes. But Go having its own scheduler has several benefits. First, Go routine creation is far faster than thread creation because you aren't creating any oper an operating system level resource. Uh, the initial stack sizes for Go routines are a lot smaller than thread stack sizes and they can grow as needed. And this makes Go routines more memory efficient. Switching between Go routines is a lot faster than switching between threads because it happens entirely within the process, which avoids operating system calls that are relatively slow. And finally, the scheduler is able to optimize its decisions because it's part of the Go process. The scheduler works with the, network prof with the network polar, detecting when Go routines can be unscheduled because of their blocking on IO. It also integrates with the garbage collector, making sure that work is properly balanced across all the operating system threads that are assigned to your Go process. And these advantages allow Go programs to spawn hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of simultaneous Go routines. Now, if you try to launch thousands of threads in a language with native threading, your program will slow to a crawl. I guarantee it, I've seen this happen. So a Go routine is launched by placing the Go keyword before a function invocation. Just like any other function, you can pass it parameters to initialize its state. However, any values returned by the function will be ignored. Any function can be launched as a Go routine. And this is very different from JavaScript, where a function only runs asynchronously if the author of the function declared it with the async keyword. But in Go, it actually is customary to launch Go routines with a closure that wraps the business logic. The closure takes care of all the concurrent bookkeeping. So for example, in the sample code that's on screen, the closure reads values out of channels and passes them to the business logic, which is completely unaware that's running a Go routine. And the result of the function is written back to a different channel. And we'll talk about channels on just the next slide. So this separation of responsibilities though, it makes your code modular and testable and keeps concurrency out of your APIs. So as we, as we just saw, Go routines communicate using channels. Like slices and maps, channels are a built-in type created by using the make function. And here's how we make a channel that transmits int. You just use make and chan int, give the type of it in the keyword chan. Uh, like maps, channels are reference types. When you pass a channel to a function, you're really passing a pointer to the channel. Also like maps and slices, the zero value for a channel is nil. We'll talk a lot about nil and channels in a bit. So use the arrow operator to interact with channels. Uh, you read from a channel by placing the arrow operator to the left of the channel variable, and you write to a channel by placing it to the right. Each value written to a channel can only be read once. If multiple Go routines are reading from the same channel, a value written to the channel will only be read by one of them. So it's rare for a Go routine to read and write to the same channel. So when assigning a channel to a variable or field or passing it to a function, use an arrow before the chan keyword to indicate that the Go routine only reads from the channel. And use an arrow after the chan keyword to indicate that the Go routine only writes to the channel. Doing so allows the Go compiler to ensure the channel is only read from or written to by your function. By default, channels are unbuffered. Every write to an open unbuffered channel causes the writing Go routine to pause until another Go routine reads from the same channel. Likewise, a read from an open unbuffered channel causes the reading Go routine to pause until another Go routine writes to the same channel. And this means you cannot write to or read from an unbuffered channel without at least two concurrently running Go routines. 
Go also has buffer channels, and these channels buffer a limited number of writes without blocking. If the buffer fills before there are any reads from the channel, a subsequent write to the channel pauses the writing go routine until the channel's read. And just as writing to a channel with a full buffer blocks, reading from a channel with an empty buffer also blocks. And a buffer channel is created by using the make keyword again and specifying the capacity of the buffer when creating the channel. So here we're creating a channel of, that holds ints that can have, has a buffer of size 10. The built-in functions len and cap, they return information about a buffer channel. Use len to find out how many values are currently in the buffer and use cap to find out the maximum buffer capacity. The, the capacity of the buffer cannot be changed. Now, if you pass an unbuffered channel to both len and cap, it returns zero. And this makes sense because by definition, an unbuffered channel doesn't have a buffer to store values. Now, the question that most developers ask about channels is whether to use buffered or unbuffered channels. Most of the time, you should use unbuffered channels. But in a little bit, we'll talk about situations where buffered channels are useful. You can also read from a channel using a for range loop. Unlike other for range loops, there's only a single variable declared for the channel, which is the value. The loop continues until the channel is closed or until a breaker return statement is reached. And when you're done writing to a channel, you, you can close it using the built-in close function. Once the channel is closed, any attempts to write to the channel or close the channel again will panic. Now, interestingly, attempting to read from a closed channel always succeeds. If a channel is buffered and there are values that haven't been read yet, they'll be returned in order. But if a channel is unbuffered or the buffered channel has no more values, the zero value for the channel's type is returned. And that leads to the question, when we read from a channel, how do we tell the difference between a zero value that was written and a zero value that's returned because the channel is closed? And we run, we run into a similar problem when reading from maps, which return a zero value if the key isn't present. And since Go tries to be a consistent language, more or less, we have a similar answer. We use the comma OK idiom to detect whether a channel has been closed or not. So as you see, when we, when we read from the channel, we have two variables on the left-hand side. And if OK is set to true, then the channel is open. If it's set to false, the channel is closed. Now, anytime you're reading from a channel that might be closed, use the comma OK idiom to ensure the channel is still open. So the responsibility for closing a channel lies with the Go routine that writes to the channel. Now, be aware that closing a channel is only required if there is a Go routine waiting for the channel to close, such as one using a for range loop to read from the channel. Now, since the channel is just another variable, Go's runtime can detect channels that are no longer used and just garbage collect them. So channels have lots of different states, each with a different behavior when reading or writing or closing. And I find this table is helpful to keep them all straight. Um, so the, the important thing here is you must avoid situations that cause Go programs to panic. As mentioned earlier, the standard pattern is to make the writing Go routine responsible for the closing the channel when there's nothing left to write. When multiple Go routines are writing to the same channel, this becomes more complicated since calling close twice in the same channel causes a panic. And furthermore, if you close a channel in one Go routine, a write to that channel from another Go routine will trigger a panic as well. So the way to address this is using a sync wait group, and we'll see an example of this later on in the talk. Now, a nil channel can be dangerous as well because it can cause your program to hang forever, but there are cases where that behavior is useful, and we'll learn about those later too. So channels are one of the two things that set apart Go's concurrency model. They guide you into thinking about your code as a series of stages and makes the data dependencies clear which makes it easier to reason about concurrency. You know, other languages, languages, they rely on global shared state to communicate between threads. And this immutable shared state makes it hard to understand how data flows through your program, which in turn makes it difficult to understand whether two threads are actually independent. So the other thing that sets apart Go's concurrency model is a select statement. It's the control structure for concurrency in Go, and it elegantly solves a common problem. If you can perform two concurrent operations, which one do you do first? You can't favor one operation over the other ones because you'll never process some of the cases. And this is called starvation. So the select keyword allows a Go routine to read from or write to one of a set of multiple channels. And it looks a great deal like a blank switch statement. Each case in a select is a read or write to a channel. If a read or write is possible for a case, it is executed along with the body of the case. And like a switch, each case in a select creates its own block. So what happens if multiple cases have channels that can be read or written? So select uses a very simple algorithm. It just picks randomly from one of the cases that can go forward. The order is unimportant. So this is very different from a switch statement, which always chooses the first case that resolves to true. But it, this also re cleanly resolves the starvation problem as no case gets favored over another and all are checked at the same time. 
Another advantage of selecting of select choosing at random is that it prevents one of the most common causes of deadlock, which is acquiring locks in an inconsistent order. If you have two Go routines that both access the same two channels and you don't use a select statement, they must be accessed, those, those channels must be accessed in the same order in both Go routines or you deadlock your program. And this means that neither one can proceed because they're waiting on each other. And if every Go routine in your Go application deadlocks, the Go runtime kills your program. So if you look at the code on screen, if you ran this program, you get the error, fatal error, all Go routines are asleep, deadlock. And what's going on here is, remember, main is running on a Go routine that, that's launched at startup by the Go runtime. And inside of our main, we launched a second Go routine that cannot proceed until CH1 is read. And the main Go routine can't proceed until CH2 is read. So if we wrap the channel access in the main Go routine in a select, you avoid the deadlock. And if, if you run this program now, you get the output two and one. Now, because select checks if any of its cases can proceed, the deadlock is avoided. The Go routine that we launched wrote the value one to CH1. So the read from CH1 into V2 in the main Go routine is able to succeed. Since select is responsible for communicating over a number of channels, it's often embedded within a for, within a for loop. And this is so common, the combination is often referred to as a for select loop. When using a for select loop, you must include a way to exit the loop also. And we'll see one way to do this when we talk about the done channel pattern. Just like switch statements, a select statement can have a default clause. Also like switch, default is selected when there are no cases in the, with channels that can be read or written. If you want to implement a non-blocking read or write in a channel, use a select with a default. So this code on screen right now, it will not wait if there's no value to read on CH. It just immediately executes the body of the default case. And we'll take a look at a use for default when we talk about back pressure. Before we finish talking about the basic tools of concurrency in Go, let me give a word of caution about combining a default case with a for loop. Having a default case inside a for select loop is almost always the wrong thing to do. It'll be triggered every single time through the loop when there's nothing to read or write for any of the cases. And this makes your for loop run constantly, which is, just uses up a great deal of CPU. It's a busy loop now. And now that we've covered the basic tools that Go provides for concurrency, let's take a look at some of the concurrency best practices and patterns. The first best practice is to keep your APIs concurrency free. Concurrency is an implementation detail and good API design should hide implementation details as much as possible. And this allows you to change how your code works without changing how your code is invoked. Practically, this means that you should never expose channels in your API's types and functions and methods. If you expose a channel, you put the responsibility of channel management on the users of your API. And that means that users now have to worry about concerns like whether or not a channel is buffered or closed or nil. And they can also trigger deadlocks by accessing your channels in an unexpected order. So this does not mean you shouldn't ever have channels as function parameters or struct fields. It just means they shouldn't be on exported functions or struct fields. And as always, there are some exceptions to this rule. Half my job is saying, I think it depends. Um, if your API is a library with a concurrency helper function, channels are going to be part of its API. So one example is a time after function, which we'll see on an upcoming slide. Another best practice to help us avoid, helps us avoid a common and subtle bug. You know, most of the time, the closure that you launch a Go routine has no parameters. And instead, it just captures values from the environment where it's declared. But there's one common situation where this doesn't work, when you're trying to capture the index or value of a for loop. So look at this code on screen. We, we launch one Go routine for each value in A. And it looks like we pass a different value into each of the Go routines, which means that we should get 4, 8, 12, 16, and 20 printed out. But if you actually ran this code, you'll see something very different. This code actually prints out 25 times. And the reason why every Go routine wrote 20 to CH is that the closure for every Go routine captured the same variable. The index and value variables in a for loop are reused on each iteration and the last value assigned to V was 10. When the Go routines get a chance to run, that's the value they see. So this problem is not unique to for loops. Anytime a Go routine depends on a variable whose value might change while the Go routine, before the Go routine launches or while the Go routine is running, you must pass that value into the Go routine. And there are two ways to address this. The first is to shadow the value within the loop. This code looks a little bit weird, but it actually works. So here we're making a copy of the V declared as part of the four range loop every time the loop iterates. And that copy is a unique variable that's captured separately. However, this is shadowing variables and shadowing can be very confusing and I recommend people avoid it. I, I avoid shadowing in general. Um, if you want to avoid shadowing and make the data flow more obvious, you can also pass the value as a parameter to the Go routine. But the important thing to remember is anytime your Go routine uses a variable whose value might change, 
make sure you pass that current value of the variable into the coroutine so it's unique to that coroutine. Um, then there's cleaning up your coroutines. Whenever you launch a goroutine function, you must make sure it will eventually exit. Unlike variables, the Go runtime can't detect that a goroutine will never be used again. If a goroutine doesn't exit, the scheduler will still periodically give it time to do nothing, which slows down the rest of your program. And this is called a goroutine leak. Now, it may not be obvious that a goroutine isn't guaranteed to exit. So for example, say you use a goroutine as a generator like Python has. And by the way, this is a short example. Please don't use a goroutine to generate a list of numbers. It's too simple of an operation, which violates one of the win to use concurrency guidelines that we discussed earlier. So anyway, though, in the common case, we use all the values from your generator, the goroutine is just going to exit. And it looks like there isn't a problem. However, if we exit that loop early, that goroutine is going to block forever, waiting for a value to be read from the channel. So that's a leak, and you have to code to avoid those. And how do you do that? So the done channel pattern provides a way to signal that a goroutine to a goroutine that it's time to stop processing. It uses a channel to signal that it's time to exit. So let's look at an example where we pass the same data to multiple functions, but only want the result from the function that returns first. So in our function, we declare a channel named done that contains data of type empty struct. We use an empty struct for the type because the value is unimportant. We never write to this channel, we only close it. And we launch a goroutine for each searcher that's passed in. The select statements in the worker goroutines wait for either a write on the result channel, which happens when the searcher function returns, or a read on the done channel. Remember that a read on an open channel pauses until there's data available, and a read on a closed channel always returns the zero value for the channel. So that means the case that reads from done will stay paused until done is closed. In search data, we read the first value written to result, and then we close done. And that signals to all the other goroutines that they should exit, preventing them from leaking. We can also use the done channel pattern to return a cancellation function alongside the channel. So let's rewrite our previous count to example to see how this works. And again, short example for to fit on a slide. Please don't write a generator to like this because concurrency overhead is just does not justify this kind of simple logic. So anyway, count to now returns two things. In addition to returning the channel, it also returns a cancel function. And that function must be called after the for loop, as we'll see on the next slide. So let's walk through how this code works. The count to function creates two channels, one that returns data and another one that signals done. Rather than returning the done channel directly, we create a closure that closes the done channel and return that closure instead. And canceling with a closure allows us to perform any additional cleanup work if needed when that, when that um, routine should shut down. And here we see how to use the new count too. We get back our channel and the cancel function. And after the for loop, we call cancel. If all the values are returned from the generator, that does nothing. But if there were remaining values, calling cancel will cause that go routine to exit. Now, this does put some responsibility on the caller of the code to do the right thing, but Go does help us here. Because Go doesn't allow unused variables, the compiler will catch if you forget to call the cancel function. And you could use an underscore to avoid assigning the cancel function to a variable, but ignoring a return parameter is something that should be documented or called out during a code review. So one of the more, most complicated techniques to master in Go concurrency is deciding when to use a buffered channel. By default, channels are unbuffered and they're easy to understand. One goroutine writes and waits for another goroutine to pick up its work, like a baton in a relay race. Buffered channels are much more complicated. You have to pick a size, since buffered channels never have unlimited buffers. Uh, proper use of a buffered channel means you must handle the case where the buffer is full and you're writing goroutine blocks waiting for a reading goroutine. So what's the proper use of a buffered channel? Uh, the case is subtle. To sum it up in a single sentence, Buffer channels are useful when you know how many goroutines you have launched, want to limit the number of goroutines you will launch, or want to limit the amount of work that's queued up. So buffer channels just work great when you want to either gather back data from a set of goroutines that you've already launched, or when you want to limit concurrent usage. And they're also helpful for managing the amount of work a system has queued up, preventing your services from falling behind and becoming overwhelmed. So let's go through a couple of examples to show how buffer channels can be used. In this first example, we're processing the first 10 results on a channel. To do this, we launch 10 goroutines, each of which writes its results to a buffered channel. We know exactly how many goroutines we've launched, and we want each goroutine to exit as soon as it finishes its work. And this means we can create a buffered channel with one space for each launched goroutine and have each goroutine write data to this channel without blocking. We can then loop exactly 10 times, reading values from our buffered channel as they are written. 
When all the values have been read, we return the results knowing we aren't leaking any goroutines. Another technique that can be implemented with a buffer channel is called back pressure. So this is a little counterintuitive, but systems perform better overall when their components limit the amount of work they're willing to perform. And we can use a buffer channel and a select statement to limit the number of simultaneous requests in a system. So in this code, we define a type called pressure gauge that contains a channel of empty structs. We can construct a new pressure gauge with the new function. We pass in the maximum number of simultaneous requests that you want to handle, and we initialize a buffer channel to the size, placing one empty struct into the channel for each simultaneous task. And we then return an instance of a pointer to pressure gauge. We limit simultaneous access to a function with the process method. Every time a goroutine wants to use the function, it calls process. The select tries to read a token from the channel. If it can, the function returns, the function runs, and the token gets returned back to the buffer channel after the function run completes. If you can't read a token from our channel, the default case runs and an error gets returned instead. And here's a quick example that uses this code with the built-in HTTP server. In our handler, we wrap the call to our function do thing that should be limited in a process check. If there are too many simultaneous requests, we'll get back an error. Otherwise, we run the function. All right, let's look at the select statement for a bit. We need to combine data from multiple concurrent sources. The select keyword is great. However, you need to properly handle closed channels. If one of the cases in a select is reading from a closed channel, it will always be successful returning back the zero value. And every time that case is selected, you need to check to make sure that the value is valid and skip the case. If reads are spaced out, your program is going to waste a lot of time reading junk values. It's another busy wait you're going to run into. So when that happens, we rely on something that looks like an error, reading from a nil channel. Now, as we saw earlier, reading from or writing to a nil channel causes your code to hang forever. And while that's bad if it's triggered by a bug, you can use a nil channel to disable a case in a select. When you detect that a channel has been closed, set the channel's variable to nil. The associated case no longer runs because the read from the nil channel never returns a value. So what else can we do with select statements? We can use them to limit the time that some code's allowed to run. Most interactive programs have to return a response within a certain amount of time. Other languages introduce additional features on top of promises or futures to add this kind of functionality, but Go's timeout idiom, it shows how you can build complicated features from existing parts. Let's take a look at this. In this code we have on screen, we have a select that chooses between two different cases. The first case takes advantage of the done channel pattern that we saw earlier. We use the goroutine closure to assign values to result in error and to close the done channel. If the done channel closes first, the read from the done succeeds and the values are returned. The second channel gets returned by the after function in the time package. Now this function has a value written to it. It returns back a channel and has a value written to it after the specified time durations passed. When this value is read before do some work finishes, time limit returns back the timeout error. And anytime you need to limit how long an operation takes and go, you see some variation on this pattern. <clears throat> One thing you should be aware of is that if we exit time limit before that goroutine finishes processing, the goroutine continues to run. We just won't do anything with the result that it will eventually return. Now, if you want to stop working a goroutine where you're no longer waiting for it to complete, that's a little bit more complicated. To do that, you take advantage of context cancellation. Instead of starting our own timer a time after, we take in a context parameter, we wrap it in a new context as the timeout that we want, and we pass that new context to the function that we're calling and wait on the new context done channel. Um, it's the job of do some works function to check the context done channel at this, as, um, to make sure that, that it returns immediately if the context times out. And just as do some work now respect the timer that we've set here, using context cancellation also means that any timeouts from previous function calls will also be applied to your current code. I'm not gonna talk a lot about the context today, but it is covered in detail in the book. All right, on to another topic. Uh, sometimes one goroutine needs to wait for multiple goroutines to complete their work. If you're waiting for a single goroutine, you can use the done channel pattern that we just saw. But if you're waiting on several goroutines, you need to use a wait group, which is found in the sync package in the standard library. And here's a simple example of what a wait group looks like. Sync wait groups don't have to be initialized, just declared because their zero value is useful. Uh, there's three methods on sync wait group. There's add, which increments the counter of goroutines to wait for. There's done, which decrements the counter and is called by a goroutine when it's finished. And there's wait, which pauses the goroutine until a counter hits zero. Add is usually just called once with the number of goroutines that are going to be launched. 
Then is called within the go routine. And to ensure that it's called, even if the go routine panics, we use a defer. Now you'll notice we didn't explicitly pass the sync wait group. And there's two reasons for this. The first is that you must ensure that every place that uses a sync wait group is using the same instance. If you pass the sync wait group to the function and don't use a pointer, then the function is a copy and the call to done won't decrement the original sync wait group. By using a closure to capture the sync wait group, we are assured that every go routine is referring to the same instance. Now, the second reason is a design, it's just design principles. Uh, remember, you should keep your concurrency out of your API. Now, as we saw with channels earlier, the usual pattern is to launch a go routine with a closure that wraps the business logic. And that closure manages issues around concurrency and the function, provided, the function provides the algorithm. So in our code sample here, we're making three function calls concurrently. When each function exits, the count of items in the wait group is decremented. And when it hits zero, wait stops waiting. Now, by the way, if we didn't use that wait group, the main function would exit and not wait for functions to return. Main does not wait for go routines to complete if there's still go routines running. So let's take a look at a more realistic example. Now, as we mentioned earlier, when you have multiple go routines writing to the same channel, you need to make sure that the channel being written to is only closed once. And a sync wait group is perfect for this. So let's see how it works in a function that processes values concurrently and gathers the results into a slice and returns back that slice. So in our example, we first create a buffer channel called out. There's one buffer entry for each processing go routine we're going to launch. We then create a wait group and use add to set it to the number of processing go routines also. Next, we launch our processing go routines. Each one reads from the input channel until it's closed. And each time the value is returned from the input channel, it's passed to the processor function. And the output of the processor function is written to the buffer channel out. And the defer statement calls done when there are no more values to read from the input channel. Next, we're going to launch a monitoring go routine that waits until all the processing go routines exit by just calling wait. And when all those go routines exit, the monitoring go routine calls close on the output channel. Now, at the end of our process and gather function, we declare a slice called result that holds the values that we're returning from our function. The for range channel loop pulls values from out and keeps on running until out is closed and the buffer is empty. And then finally, process and gather returns back the processed values. So while wake groups are very handy, they shouldn't be your first choice when coordinating go routines. Use them only when you have something to clean up, like closing a channel that all your go routines are writing to after all your worker go routines exit. So let's go back to that example from the first section of the talk. We have a function that calls three web services. We send data to two of those services and then take the results of those two calls and send them to the third, returning the results. Entire process must take less than 50 milliseconds or an error gets returned. And we can use all those things we've seen so far to implement this. We'll start with the function that we're going to invoke. The first thing we do is set up, the, set up a context that times out after 50 milliseconds. As we covered earlier, one advantage of using the context timer is that it allows us to respect timeouts that are set by the function that called this function as well. After you create a context, you use defer to make sure the context cancel function is called. Um, if you're not used to this, remember, you must call the cancel function on a context. You do a context with timeout or resources are going to leak. Now we're going to be using A and B as the names for those first two services that we're going to call. So we'll make a new AB processor to call them. We then start processing with a call to the start method and then wait for our results with a call to the wait method. When wait returns, we do a standard go error check. And if all is well, we call our third service, which we're calling C. Same as before, we start processing with the call to the start method on the C processor and then wait for the result with a call to the wait method on the C processor. And then we return that result of the method call. Now, this code looks a lot like standard sequential code without concurrency. So let's see how our AB processor and our C processor do with their work with concurrency, see how the concurrency happens. The AB processor has three fields, all channels, out A, out B, and errors. And we'll see how to use all these channels over the next couple of slides. Notice that every channel is buffered so that the go routine that writes them can exit after writing without waiting for a read to happen. And the errors channel is a buffer of size two because it could be written, it could have two, up to two errors written to it. The start function launches two go routines. The first one gets, the first one calls get result A to talk to the A service. If the call returns an error, we write to the error channel. Otherwise, we write to the out A channel. And since those channels are buffered, the go routine will not hang no matter which channel is written to. Also, notice we're passing the context along to get result A, which allows it to cancel processing if the timeout happens. Second go routine is just like the first, only calls get result B and writes to the out B channel on success. The wait method on the AB processor is the most complicated method we're going to see for this, for this problem. We define our out variable C in. We then have a for loop that counts to two. Inside the loop, we have a select statement. 
If we read a value on out A, we were set the A field on input C. If we read a value on out B, we set the B field on input C. If we read a value on the errors channel, we return immediately with an error. Finally, if the context times out, we return immediately with the error from the context error method. If we read both fields, we exit the loop, return the input that we're going to use for our C processor. So the C processor looks like a simpler version of the AB processor. It has one out channel and one error channel. The start method on the C processor looks like the start method on the AB processor. It just launches a Go routine with the calls get result C with the input data, writes the error channel on error, writes the out C channel on success. And finally, the wait method on the C processor is a simple select statement that just checks to see if there's a value to read from the out C channel, the errors channel, or the context done channel. And that's it. You know, by structuring our code with Go routines and channels and select statements, we separate the individual steps, allow independent parts to run and compete and complete in any order, and cleanly exchange data between the dependent parts. In addition, we make sure that no part of the program hangs, and we properly handle timeouts set both within this function and from earlier functions in the call history. Now, if you're not convinced this is a better method for implementing concurrency than you usually see in other languages, try to implement this in another language, and you might be surprised at how difficult it all is. Uh, that's all I have for you today. Hope everyone learned a little bit about concurrency in Go. So the book also covers other concurrency topics, such as how to run your code exactly once and when to use mutexes instead of channels. Lots and lots of other topics are there as well, showing you how to write idiomatic Go code. Uh, the link on screen will give you 30-day access to O'Reilly Learning, including Learning Go. And some lucky winners tonight are going to get copies of the book. Uh, thanks for your time. Do you have any questions? Didn't see any in the chat. <clears throat> see, anybody have a question? No, oh, Jay. Everybody to ready to use channels <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> I, uh, I don't. I don't actually have a question about concurrency. Uh, I do have a question about currency. Um, it piqued my interest because you are at City. Um, I was curious if you're in an area where you actually work with monetary values and if you use any type of concurrency uh, package from anyone or do you just work with the, you know, ints and multiply by the cents or something like that? Oh, oh. Um, so uh, close. I work for Capital One. Um, oh, sorry. I, uh, no, no problem. Uh, uh, Paul used to work for Citibank, I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Way back. <laughs> yeah. Three Eventually, times. all of us work for a bank. I'm pretty sure at some at some point in our career. That's just how it, they hire lots of engineers. Um, and then it's AWS after that, by the way. <laughs> um, so we do. So I am not on any of the teams that are dealing with financial values with Go, um, but there are teams that are. I can't talk much about internal operation of the Capital One, but yes, we do. I'm pretty sure the teams that are doing um, Go work that involves money do use the concurrency use the currency packages that are out there. There are a couple, um, and yeah, the, the important thing, please don't use floats. That's like, as long as you're not using floats, I'm okay. Um, you can use ints, uh, just make sure that you have to make sure that you're keeping track in mills, or you're keeping track in cents. You'd go to thousands of a, of a penny, thousands of a, of a dollar instead of the cents. Um, but there are a couple of good, concurrent, good currency packages out there that solve those problems for you. All right, um, I, thank you, that's great. Yeah, sure. Uh, Steve just asked, any advice about writing tests for concurrent code? And is that covered in the book? There is a whole chapter on testing in the book. Um, I don't talk about testing concurrent code specifically, but I do talk about table tests. And so usually the best, so if, you, if you use the table test, test idiom in, for testing your code, it can help you do some of the concurrent testing. Um, also I talk about dependency injection and kind of abstracting away some of your uh, logic if you want to hide things. So oftentimes, especially for unit testing, you want, this is one of the reasons why you want to break out the concurrency code from your business logic. Because ideally I can test my business logic without having to worry about concurrency or external services or databases or anything else. I can, I can, I can wrap, I wrap the business logic in concurrence using a closure and any service that I'm going to call, I can, I can mock out or stub out with some, you know, some, some service, something that looks like a service using an interface. Um, so if using an HTTP client making requests, I don't know if you've seen the HTTP test package in Go. Um, which is fantastic. You can actually stand up a server inside of your Go application and it will launch a little HTTP server for you, return back a client that talks to that service. You, you provided a handler to handle requests. Um, there is an example of that in the book, by the way, of using HTTP client. I, that was 
you know, that, they, they, that chapter went long, but I couldn't leave that out. That was like, well, I had to have the HTTP tests up in there. Um, but running tests for concurrency, um, try to get your currency out of your test is my first advice, because it does make things a little bit tricky. Um, but beyond that, you can use the dash race. I, I talk about the race detector. There's, there's a section to talk about. The, if you're not aware of this, Go has a race detector built into it that you can do by compiling your code. So you type in go test dash race or go build dash race, it launches a race checker inside of it. And what that does is it's not perfect. It will not catch it 100%. But if you access the same variable from multiple, multiple Go routines without a lock around it, it should be able to detect that this has been accessed without a lock. And it will immediately crash your program and give you a stack trace tells you exactly where in the code this happened, which Go routines were both accessing that same logic, the same, same variable. So it can't catch deadlocks, but it can catch one of the things people do, which is access global variables from two different threads, three different Go routines, I should say. Um, let's see, uh, should I use, oh, let's see, uh, should I use, uh, so should I use rec, uh, request equals request with context or wrap with a go, go and close done? Um, let's see. Um, Use rec with context, absolutely. Um, because then because the request, the the built HTTP client will take care of listening for the context being closed for you. You don't want to write that code yourself. Um, if you do if you do a closed, if you wrote your own Go routine, you have to take care of listening for it yourself. I'm not even sure how you could get inside of the the you could you could take advantage of like hacking and writing your own round tripper, I think, and maybe make that work. I wouldn't do that. I would just take advantage of requesting it for you. Um uh, is there a simple way to determine if you need to be concurrent or not? But do you have a general set of rules you tend to follow when looking to make something concurrent? Um, yes. If there's IO involved, if there's IO involved, it can be parallelized. So if I'm running a service that talks to a bunch of other services and gathers data back, that's concurrent, obviously. If, if I'm only waiting for one service to come back, um, I can use a context timeout and hopefully my database driver or my HTTP client takes care of that timeout for me instead of me having to do it myself. But anytime you've got this kind of um, spread out and then gather back in again pattern in your code, concurrency kind of falls out of that. Um, but again, if it's like, if you're just doing in-memory processing, if I'm doing like an image interpolation, uh, I'm trying to do that concurrently, maybe. Um, it'd have to be a pretty big image to be worthwhile uh, and probably go in the right language for that problem in the first place. Does that answer your question, Ray? Um, okay, Bell. So um, I think they answer your question, about but why it's different. Um, you want to request. You want to have the request. You want to have HTTP client and go take care of that concurrency for you, and take care of canceling the request rather than you doing it yourself because you don't have access to the underlying I/O. Um, go I/O is blocking I/O under the cover. So use so other languages provide both ePoll and ways to do way to do asynchronous I/O. Go doesn't. Um, you can get to it if you want to, like play with like some OS level stuff. But in general, IO and Go is meant to be synchronous, and you have Go routines provide the asynchronicity for you. So um, it's trying to do asynchronous IO with like ePoll stuff is hard. I would, I'm glad I don't have to do it. Uh, any more questions? I think that may be all we have. All right. Anyone else? Don't be shy. Okay. We've got Jonathan here. We've got an expert. He wrote the book. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I'm now 50% smarter because I wrote, I wrote down things. And now <laughs> I used to just say them and people wouldn't listen. And now that I have a book about it. People have to listen to me, I guess, <laughs> how the rule works. I have, uh, I have another question then uh, for Jonathan. Sure, go ahead. Um, when you were, uh, let's say, you know, uh, sharing bits of your book with people or asking for help or getting reviews, did you find that the concern, uh, concurrency section was an area that people tended to have a harder time with? And that's why you, you kind of focused on trying to, to, to teach it and share your knowledge about it? Um, yeah, I've done talks on concurrency before, and they were always very boring. I hope this was better than usual. Um, I've done concurrency talks that kind of like went on in like exacting detail about all the channel stuff. And they were like, if, I thought they were just like people's eyes would glaze over. I hope this is a little bit better talking more about the best practices. Um, it's hard. This section of the book was, I had to go over this section of the book a couple of times. And actually, I'll be fully upfront that the, the closing example is in the book also. The version of the book is worse. Um, I, I was, it's more complicated. And as I was preparing this talk, I started like trying to explain this for a talk. And I realized, oh God, the example in the book is bad. I should have a better one. So you, got, you saw the better example here. Um, they both, they, they function correctly, but the other one's harder to understand and break it down. 
Um, and one of my reviewers had actually said, the example in the book's too complicated. And I, I ignored him, but he was absolutely right. So uh, again, I'm, it, it, I, yeah. I get these things wrong sometimes too. It, it's yeah. hard because you don't, people don't think concurrently. Um, this is, that, that's just the nature of how people's brains work. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Jonathan. I do uh, agree that uh, your presentation was different than others. Uh, I think everyone probably really liked seeing uh, the best practices and, and, you know, the layout of the, the graph you had and everything. Um, and when the, you know. um, on that same note, um, oh, God, no, my concurrent brain is not working. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Um, I, I'm guessing, and I don't know if I'm speaking for everyone, but concurrency for me and when switching to go from C after 20 years of C, um, it was one of those areas where I did have to read multiple different books, read many different medium articles, you know, stack over for you name it. And I found I was reading too much. I had to actually stop and actually code and do test programs before I really started to understand it. Is that something you also recommend or you've seen? Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I've written a, a few different blog posts on concurrency that date back several years. Someone actually just pointed, I, I wrote one on how to make an infinite buffer. So you have a channel that never stops, that they can take infinite amounts of uh, requests in, um, which somehow the, the code for it disappeared off the internet. I had to like, recreate it this morning. Um, I wouldn't actually use this code in production, in production to be honest, but mostly I was using it as a way to demonstrate, hey, here's some cool, here are some cool things and behaviors, like it shows the nil channel pattern where you use a nil to turn off a select case um, and uses some closures to capture some state. So it, it's interesting, that blog post is interesting because of, of the techniques that let me figure out but I probably wouldn't actually use that in, in code in production for real. Um, yeah, it's, you have to just use it and you're gonna, you're gonna make a mistake. I, I will tell you right now, concurrency in Go is so much better than doing it in C. That the, um, this is actually for me, Java actually was like my first time, the first time I got some of these techniques was actually Java. And in 1995, 96, when I first wrote a, 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 a um, HTTP server in, it was a socket server, it wasn't even HTTP, it was a socket server in Java instead of doing it in C. And it's like made threads for me automatically. I was like, this is amazing. Like, I don't have to worry about like launching threads and C anymore. Um, so that that was, and Go's version of this, is, I think is even better. And Java is about to adopt it actually. Um, Project Loom is, is Java doing green threads that are multiplexed inside, the, inside of the JVM instead of doing OS level threads. So it's the, this pattern, I talk about this pattern as being unique to Go. It's not anymore. Like everyone saw this said, wow, this is better. Rust adopted it, Clojure adopted it. Java's starting to adopt it. Um, JavaScript is sticking to those async keywords. Um, that's a choice. <laughs> uh, uh, Josiah had a question. Um, what's your general strategy for determining the size of the worker pool, go max procs at runtime? Yeah, that's a good way to go. I've seen people do something like two times go max procs. Um, you can play with it a bit because again, you can't, uh, this is again, this goes back to Java experience. People always sit there and say, my Java server is not handling enough requests. I better make my thread pool, make my Java listener pool really big. I'm like, it's not going to help your code. It's just going to get slower and slower as more requests come in. Like, no, 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 it'll help. I'm like, it's not going to help because you know there's only so many, there's only so much CPU, right? So if you're doing work and the CPU is, is occupied, then you're just not going to get more out of it. Um, it depends really on your I/O balance. If you're, it could be I/O bound or CPU bound. The more I, more CPU bound you are, the smaller it makes sense for your worker pool. Um, the more IO bound you are, the more things you get in there at the same time. But that again goes back to you have to measure. There's, there's no hard and fast answer. It's try it, measure, and come back to it. Um, it's it's the hard work. That, that helped answer the question, Isaiah. Um, so, uh, are there Go libraries publicly available, and how do you know if they're compatible with your version? Is different versions different version compatible? Um, concurrency libraries, or um, in general. So Go modules are kind of fascinating. I have the, there's a whole chapter in the book on that, uh, on, on modules. Uh, the, the current system has been around for two years now, two and a half years. Um, it, there's a long history with it. Um, there were some hurt feelings because there was a group that thought they had, they, had, they were in a tool called Delve. They thought, not a Delve, um, what was it called again? They thought they were the blessed tool. And then Russ Cox came down from the mountaintop one February and said, this is the way we're doing modules. And they were um, surprised. So, oh yeah, so, so AWS, yeah. So Go modules are supposed to be versioned. Um, and so versioning, AWS versioned their modules wrong. But so the, the original, it, AWS's Go 1.0 library is terrible. It's clearly a direct port of the Java version. Um, GitHub did the same thing where the GitHub's library for Go is clearly a port of the Java library. 
Um, and you see a lot of pointers hanging out in your APIs. I have a chapter on pointers that talks about when not when to use pointers and when not to use them. But if you see lots of things passing around pointers and go, you're probably doing the wrong thing. So um, yeah, so go so go library. So because go go if you go is relying on semantic versioning to do to do versioning. Um, and the answer is not incredibly satisfying because they're hoping the developers do the right thing. So it's the responsibility of the developer as long as the version numbers, as long as the major version is still 0.x or 1.x, that it's back, if it's 0.x, anything goes. I can break myself, it's your fault for depending on me. Once I hit 1.0.0, it's the developer's responsibility to maintain a consistent API until you hit 2.0. And the way Go solves this is what you have to do is if you go from version one to version two, it's fine to introduce a backwards breaking change, but the import path has to change as well. So there has to be a V2 on the import path for version two, a V3 for version three and so on. You can do this by tagging it, you can do this by creating a separate directory inside of your project. So the top level might be version one, maybe some directory called version two, and that's where your V2 code lives. Um, this is unsatisfying because it's hard work, but it's part of making it painful to make a backwards breaking change. Um, also, if, so if the intent is that if you have two different libraries that both import the same third library, and one of them imports version 1.1, 1 .1, one imports version 1.2, it'll pull in version 1.2. And 1.2 should be backwards compatible with 1.1. If it's not, um, the answer is go talk to the person maintaining that library and tell them to fix their backwards incompat incompatibility, which again, it's an unsatisfying answer. Some languages like pull in multiple copies of libraries to try to like hide them from each other. But the fact is that doesn't work well either, especially if there's someone like packageable state, one of them initialized it, now you have two copies of it, what's gonna win? So the answer becomes, no matter what, you have to just talk about it. The community, community comes in as the answer. And hopefully if someone breaks their libraries, then the community stops using it. Um, some problems are solved by people and technology can't solve everything. Um, yeah, I, I really like Go modules too. Um, I, I, at first I hated minimum version selection, which is, um, it tries to find the smallest version that, that works. And may, I've used Maven for years and years, which would pull in the biggest version that works. And now I understand why pinning your version is very important because if that newer version introduces the bug, um, you wanna make sure your builds are consistent, right? I wanna make sure that if I give you my code, you build the exact same thing I build. And by locking to one particular version, minimum version selection ensures that. The Maven approach where you can get the latest thing that works means I build something, you build something for my project, you may pull a different dependency. And that's, it's the, the excuses you're getting the latest bug fixes, but the fact is you're not getting the same thing I built. And I want an immutable, identical thing that everyone's building so we can all agree what the bugs are. Um, sorry, I, I, I can talk for a long time, but. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that's only me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. My, my day job is talking instead of coding. So um, I, I uh, might do anymore. <laughs> Ah, any other questions? Okay. Yeah, go ahead and while we wait here, let me uh, go ahead and switch to you. Oh, Steve had a question. Yeah. It's good. Oh. oh, anything else the language needs besides generics? Um, uh, that's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> I would like better immutability. I would like, some, I'd like to have some types. So if you're from um, some of the work on, if you're not familiar with some types, they're, they're a way to create basically a bounded set of, of legal implementations of a type. Um, and so some of the generics work may lead to being able to do some, some types is how languages like Rust do enumerations. And so it would be really nice to get that into Go because the current enumeration support's pretty terrible and has lots of weaknesses to it. Um, and there are some things we can do with type switches that might be nice to do with some types. So that would be nice. Better immutability would be good in Go. Um, some types are, may happen at some point in the future. Better immutability, I don't think it's going to. You just have to be good with using your value types to fake out immutability. All right. All right. Well, let me go ahead and then. Uh... Get this thing showing up here again. I'm like losing windows here. <laughs> so it's a tightly run ship I've got here. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. 
Let's see. There we go. I think I'm all set here now. All right. Go ahead and... All right, the wrap up. All right, well, um, yeah, so anybody uh, just yeah, kind of keep us in the loop. If there's any uh, kind of uh, topics that you'd like to see uh, done, uh, any other authors you'd like us to track down, um, anything, just uh, let us know. Go ahead and give me a... Uh, Give me a shout out somehow via, you know, open an issue on our repo or uh, via Twitter or whatever or direct. Um, I will be more than happy to uh, track down some uh, some more speakers. So that's good stuff. Yeah. And then uh, again, uh, if, for those of you in the, the St. Louis area, probably want to get onto the STL Slack. Um, otherwise, just join the uh, the more global Gopher Slack. Uh, that's you know that is a goal. Uh, yeah, I'm losing my voice now. Uh, that is a global uh, Slack community for uh, just everything Go. Um, it's good stuff. There's a lot of good good banter on there. So don't uh, don't social distance alone. And hopefully, hopefully. This isn't going to last a whole lot longer, so we're we're almost there. Stay on target. Um, and now the giveaway. So yeah, special thanks for. Uh, and I put Jet Brains on there, and I did not get confirmation from Brandon that we have another license. I'm almost 100% positive that we do, but we might have to just uh, give that out next month. But uh, anyway, we do have three ebooks or print for us only they'll uh, they'll mail them uh to give away and then uh you know with unfortunately uh jonathan won't be able to sign them for you that would be that would be pretty cool so, <laughs> so anyway we're gonna try this here now i'm gonna i'm gonna put on a like uh my screen here to see everybody's names on here so I want to make sure. Okay. All right. So I've got uh, 11 of us on here. So there's there's nine of us. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just uh, get to a random number. Or I don't know. I, or else, Jonathan, do you want to go ahead and pick out uh, three numbers from, uh, let's see, 1 to 11? <clears throat> let's we see. We can do it that way. Random.org? I don't want to. That, hey, that works. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Come on here. There we go. All right. Let's see. Um, generate three random numbers between one and 11. Get numbers. All right. Number 10. Okay, we've got Scott Anderson. All right, number. <laughs> oh, glad you're happy about getting the books. <laughs> uh, number five. All right, that would be Francis Alifat. All right, and finally, number two. Oh, that, that one can't work because that's you. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> One and two, uh, that, that's, uh, yeah, that's you and I. So, uh, yeah, All we're right. excluded. Lucky number nine. All right, number nine. That would be uh, uh, Ray Bednara. All right. So I guess if I could get the three of your emails, um, and in that way then I can put that into contact with the appropriate person at O'Reilly. Let me see. Uh, let's see, just, yeah, okay. Yeah, just send me the uh, email addresses and then I can uh, have them ship them out to you uh, or uh, email to you. Um, let me know your preference on whether you want a print book or the ebook. I don't know, who knows, it might be both. I don't know. We'll see. 
but uh, yeah, and unfortunately, if you want a print book, you got to be in the U.S. So uh, just in case. So if you want to just chat that to me, let me make sure before I continue on that you all sent that to me. Let's see. Okay, so I got Francis, I got Scott, and I got Ray. Okay, cool. All right, so we're we're set with that then. And so now the teaser for uh, next month, we're going to have uh, Charles Pretzer. Uh, if you're on in the Twitter sphere, he's known as the uh, the Mesh DeLorean, but uh, it's <laughs> we're going to do a little bit more of a uh, CNCF spin for next time. Um, we're going to be talking to him uh, about uh, Linkerd. Uh, which is a service mesh implementation. And uh, the control plane of that application is actually written in Go, and in, uh, but they do have uh, proxies that run on other applications that are written in Rust. So it's uh, kind of cool. They, two, of the, uh, two of the primo languages for cloud native. So, so he will be speaking to us next month. And again, that's on May 26th. Um, so I'll be looking forward to that. So anyway, that's all I've got. Uh, Jonathan, thank you again for speaking to us. That was, uh, it was awesome. Uh, yeah, concurrency is one of those things where it's just like, it, it can be a little tricky for sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so uh, thank you again. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, everybody, we'll see you all next month. Uh, be safe. Hopefully everyone does well. And then uh, we'll see you then. Alrighty. Thank you. Bye-bye.